الذين تتوفاهم الملائكة هو ذا كافرين they are those who تتوفاهم الملائكة the angels take at the time of death meaning when the angels come to take their souls at the time of death what was the state of these kafirin they were ظالمي أنفسي they were doing ظلم on themselves ظالمي is actually ظالمين but the noon is dropped because ظالمي أنفسي him There's idafa over here. It's murakab idafi. Okay, those of you who are familiar. So, ظالمي أنفسهم They were doing ظلم on themselves. When the angels came to take their souls, these people were busy doing ظلم on themselves. What is ظلم? We think ظلم is like hitting someone, killing them, torturing them, physically abusing them, taking their money away. Would anyone do that to themselves? I mean, there are cases when people do ظلم on themselves like that, but rare. What is this ظلم talking about then? What kind of ظلم is this? The ظلم of sin. Sin. Disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doing those actions that will bring about Allah's anger. Why is it called ظلم? Why is it called injustice? Why is sin called injustice against oneself? Yes, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this time, gave us this freedom, gave us opportunities. Why? So that we throw ourselves into hellfire? Is that why? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this time, this opportunity, this life. Why? So that we do something good and through this effort earn a place in Jannah. But when a person does those actions which will take him to hellfire, then what is he doing? He's being unfair to himself. He's being unfair to himself. You know, this is like a person has been given money. He's got money in his pocket. And he has the ability, the time to go buy clothes, to go buy food. But what does he do? He throws the money and he goes sleeps on a bench in a park. This is crazy. This is literally craziness. What else is it? He's doing ظلم on himself. Likewise, a person when he's committing a crime, like for example, robbing someone's house, he goes in, breaks a window, goes into the house in order to steal something, and what does he get? Hardly any money. And then he's caught. Was it worth it? Was it worth those $200 that you found? No, it wasn't worth it. You're doing ظلم on yourself. So likewise, when we commit sin, when we're doing sin, When we're disobeying Allah, we might think we're having the best time of our life. But in reality, we are bringing about eternal pain, eternal suffering and misery on ourselves. I mean, you hear these words all the time. Don't do this, you'll ruin your future. Drive carefully, make sure you don't get any tickets because it's going to ruin your future. Keep away from bad company, it's going to ruin your future. But what is the real future that we should be concerned about? the akhirah. And if a person commits sin, he's doing zulm on himself. So those people whom when the angels come to take their souls at the time of death, what were they busy in? Sin. The disbelievers are who? The mutakabbirin are who? Those who were busy committing sin. Can you imagine dying in the state of sin? Dying in the state of sin? Over here in this ayah in particular, zulm refers to shirk. Kufr. Because in the previous ayat, what is mentioned? Rejecting the oneness of Allah, rejecting the hereafter, rejecting prophethood. But from this we also learn any other sin also that a person is engaged in at the time of death. Terrible. Assalamu alaikum. I was listening to a lecture by uh, Abdul Bari Yahya. The title of it was uh, A Bad Ending. And in it he is giving a set of examples of people who ended badly where they were found in a situation where they were supposed to be. There's many, many examples. There's only one that I can remember now. It's uh, this uh, brother who was on the highway. He got into an accident, so the car got into some kind of tumbling, turning around. And the person who was trying to help him got there, and he was still alive, alhamdulillah. And then but the car was upside down, and he was inside the car, strapped in, and he couldn't move. So the person said, what can I do for you while we're waiting for, you know, the, the ambulance to get here? He says, just lit a cigarette for me. And the person said, are you sure you want to do this? He said, yes, please just go ahead. So the person lit the cigarette, put it in, and unfortunately because there was oil leaking, the car went up 
into flames and he died in that state where he was actually really not dead but because of it he blew into he got he, he got killed that way so because of the state of naza you know when a person is unconscious you know not fully conscious not fully unconscious then what happens what's deep down in his heart and his mind that is what comes to the surface the fears that they may have the wishes that they may have the one whom they love the one whom they hate i mean these are the things that they talk about so zalimi anfusihim now remember that some sins are such that a person is uh, actively engaged in like for example stealing or for example eating something haram saying something bad this is a kind of sin which a person is actively involved in but there are some other sins which a person you can say is passively involved in. meaning he's not really in the act of it but this is what he's been doing you know like for example a person says i'm a doctor but doesn't mean that all the time they're examining sick people no they're a doctor even when they are sleeping even when they are eating so the state of zulm means that they were in a state they were living a lifestyle a lifestyle in which was some sin meaning some sin was prevalent whether that sin is of shirk or kufr or some haram whatever it may be zalimi anfusihim but when the angels showed up before them to take their souls away what was the reaction of these people fa alqaw salam fa alqaw so they put down meaning they offered as salam surrender they surrendered right there like yeah we will listen to you they surrender to the angels and they say ma kunna na'malu min su we weren't doing anything wrong we weren't doing anything wrong i'm innocent i'm innocent i've never heard a lie i've never done anything wrong ma kunna na'malu min su they start lying at that time just to save themselves you know like a criminal is caught red handed and he comes up with this bizarre story to show that he wasn't really committing that crime it was an accident or he didn't really mean to do it or somebody else was doing it and they just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time so they appear as the criminal whereas they weren't actually the criminal ma kunna na'mal min su we weren't doing anything wrong and many people do this that when they're caught they come up with some false excuse to show that they were innocent now before a human being like for example a mother maybe that story will help you or maybe before a teacher a false excuse might work but the angels of allah would it work over there this false excuse would it work no why because the angels i mean come on they record your sins they record your deeds فالقوا السلام ما كنا نعمل من سوء بلى ان الله عليم بما كنتم تعملون rather allah is fully aware of what you used to do فدخلوا so on the day of judgment they will be told enter abwaba jahannam the doors of hellfire khalidin fiha abiding therein eternally fala bi'sa mathwa al mutakabbirin so surely how bad is the home of those who are arrogant what is the home of the arrogant hellfire not paradise because there's only two destinations in the hereafter either jannah or nar if a person has pride that will not allow him to enter jannah so what's the other option hellfire fala bi'sa mathwa al mutakabbirin wa qila and it is said lil ladina to those people who ittaqaw those who fear allah now another kind of attitude is being portrayed one is of arrogance proud towards allah munkira not willing to accept the oneness of allah looking down on the truth belittling the truth rejecting it constantly so such people who live such arrogant lives what will happen at the time of death they will try to surrender and they will try to come up with anything to save themselves from punishment on the day of judgment when they'll be questioned where are your gods what will their response be nothing they will be silent so embarrassed so scared they won't be able to speak even on the other hand are those who are humble towards their lord who fear their lord who realize that their lord allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them so many blessings and out of this gratitude they're also afraid of their lord they're too shy to even sin they're too shy to turn away from obedience 
So such people who have shukr, who have taqwa, when they are asked, مَاذَا أَنزَلَ رَبُّكُمْ So what is it that your Lord has sent? What is your opinion about the Qur'an? What do you say about the Book of Allah? So if someone was to ask you, what do you think about the Qur'an? What would you say? What would your answer be? If someone says in one word, tell me, what is the Qur'an? Huh? A blessing? Guidance? Anybody else? Words of Allah. Somebody is asking you, what is your opinion? How would you describe the Qur'an? What do you say about the Qur'an? What do you think about the Qur'an? I mean, the answers that she gave me, they're right. Blessing, okay. That I understand. But guidance, this is something in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself tells us that Qur'an is hidayah. So, what do you think about the Qur'an? My savior to the hereafter, okay. Peace, okay. Amazing. You know, for example, if somebody says, have you tried that drink? That new coffee at Tim Hortons? Have you tried it? Uh, a person might say, garbage. Another might say, it is amazing. Another person might say, it's okay. Not that impressive. Another person might say, I like the variety. Hmm? Another might say, I think it's too strong. So what you say is what you feel. What you feel. Your genuine feelings are expressed in the words that you say about something. So when people of taqwa are asked, what do you think about the Qur'an? Qalu they say, Khaira. It's all good. It is all good. It's nothing but good. Every part of the Qur'an, every word of the Qur'an, every ayah of the Qur'an, every surah of the Qur'an, every command of the Qur'an is good. Why do they say this? Because that's what they feel. That the Qur'an is a source of khayr. Not a source of problems, it's a source of khayr. That since they have discovered the Qur'an, since they have learned the Qur'an, they have only received goodness. In whatever way, shape or form. You know, recently this lady, she was telling me that from childhood she used to cry a lot. She was one of those people who cry a lot. You know, over every little thing. They fell and they cried and they got hurt and they cried and someone said something and they cried. Many girls are like that. They're like too emotional. It's like you need just a small trigger and the tears will come. Many of you are smiling. Are you like that too? Anyway, so she said that now I think about it and I feel that I don't cry that much like I used to before. I'm not that overly sensitive anymore. Why? She says, the only difference I feel is that the Qur'an is now in my life. I have a source of comfort. You know, my soul was hungry. My heart is now fed. I have peace. I have happiness. And this is why every little thing doesn't bother me to the point that I'm crying all the time and I'm so weak in my heart. No, this Qur'an has brought me strength. So, qalu khaira. They say Qur'an is all good. Why do they say Qur'an is all good? Because Qur'an is really all good. What about some controversial issues? Like Surah An-Nisa and marrying four wives and beating the women and certain other verses would say kill the disbelievers wherever you find them. So such verses even, what do they say about them? It's khayr. Because they understand them in the proper context. Not out of context, in the proper context, in its relevant situation. So as a result, everything is good to them. Now, it may happen that there are certain commands or certain statements that you still struggle to come to terms with because of who you are. And each person is different. That, for example, one person might say, everything makes sense to me. However, this, I don't know why, I still don't get it. Or I understand, I believe in it, but I still cannot do it. Do we have such struggles? Huh? But even then, what is the attitude of the humble servant? He says, Quran is good. I have that fault. You know, I'm not strong enough to still take it on. I'm not strong enough to observe it. I'm, you know, weak in my mind that I still don't understand. There's no problem with the Quran. There's no problem with the book of Allah because it's the word of Allah. If 
in everything that Allah decrees, there is goodness. Then of course, in everything that Allah has commanded, there is goodness. Right? So, qalu khaira. There's a problem in my understanding. There's a problem in my nafs, in my heart, my desires. There's a problem here. Not with the Qur'an. Qalu khaira. Such people who are so humble towards Allah, towards the book of Allah, Allah says, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا فِي هَذِهِ الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا For those people who do good, in this life, for them is good. In this life, they will receive good. They will get a lot of goodness. How? A lot of money? Not necessarily. Fame? Not necessarily. Peace of heart? Peace of mind? Contentment? Yes, for sure. A happy life? Yeah. Despite the difficulties? Yes. You know, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, people would ask him the most complicated questions. The most complicated questions. And uh, questions were sent to him, even when he was in jail. Such questions which, you know, when he answered, he got into a lot of trouble. But it was amazing that every answer that he gave, he would bring the evidence from the Qur'an and Sunnah. And people would be amazed. That how is it that you derive the evidence from the Qur'an and Sunnah? Because when the Qur'an has been used as evidence, and the evidence makes sense, it's logical, then who can argue over there? So his answers were always very convincing, very convincing, to the point that the people that he debated with, many times after the debate, his opponents would come to him, and they would apologize for having debated with him. Because his opinion, his viewpoint was absolutely logical, it made perfect sense. And he was very convincing because he used the Qur'an and Sunnah as evidence, always. And there were times when he would not be able to find an answer. He would not be able to understand something. He said that, at times I go through a hundred tafasir, books of tafsir, to understand the meaning of one ayah. Can you imagine using a hundred, hundred books? To find out the meaning of one verse, one sentence. And then he said that I would go to, you know, a deserted far off masjid outside the city where no people would regularly come and, you know, fall into sajda and rub my head and nose in the dust and make dua. Ya mu'allima Adam. That, O oh, teacher of Adam, O oh, teacher of Ibrahim, teach me also. You taught Adam, teach me also. You taught Ibrahim, teach me also. Ya Mufahima Sulaiman, fahim me. O one who gave understanding to Sulaiman, you give me understanding too. What you, O Allah, have said is haq. Teach me to understand it. Give me the understanding to accept it. And it is this humility because of which so much was made clear to him. You know, scholars said about him that it was as though all knowledge would be before Ibn Taymiyyah's eyes. You know, when he would be speaking, or when he would be writing, it was as if everything is in front of him. Okay? And he would take from it whatever he wants, and he leaves from it whatever he wants. You know, it's like if something is written in front of you, then what can you do? You can take one word here, one word here, one word there. He knew it so well, he understood it so well, that he would... Uh, make use of it so much. And it's this humility, this attitude, this ibadah, this worship, this submissiveness that really brought him happiness in his life. So much so that I told you earlier, he was imprisoned, he was exiled, he had so many enemies from all groups of people. He had enemies, but that man was never sad. Ibn Qayyim said about him, I have not seen anyone live a good life like him. Meaning, the life of Ibn Taymiyyah was really a beautiful life. A beautiful life. We think a beautiful life is what? That you're living in a castle and everybody's your friends and everything is beautiful, everything is good. This is what a beautiful life is. His life was spent where? Traveling, in the prison, debating, being forced to come to a debate or, you know, something like that. So, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا فِي هَذِهِ الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا Those who do good for them in this life will be goodness. Allah will not 
delay their award to the hereafter only. No, he will give them entry into Jannah even in this life. And you know, Ibn Taymiyyah said that whoever does not enter Jannah now will not be able to enter Jannah later. What was he talking about? That Jannah is what? The peace and contentment, happiness, sukoon, rida. That feeling of rida. That no matter what happens, you're at peace. No matter what happens, you're calm. So, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا فِي هَذِهِ الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَلَا دَارُ الْآخِرَةِ خَيْرٍ But surely the home of the hereafter, that's much better. Of course, what is in Jannah, the reward that is over there, there's no comparison to it. وَلَا نِعْمَ دَارُ الْمُتَّقِينَ And surely how good is the home of those who have taqwa. So who are those who have taqwa? Those who are humble. Those who are not proud. Those who accept everything that Allah has given them. They might find difficult, but they still say, it's good. Jannatu Adanin. What is the home of the people of taqwa? Gardens of eternity. Yadukhulunaha. Which they will enter. Tajri min tahtiha al-anhar. Underneath which rivers flow. Lahum fiha ma yasha'oon. For them is whatever they wish for. In Jannah, every wish is fulfilled. كَذَلِكَ يَجْزِ اللَّهُ الْمُتَّقِينَ Thus does Allah reward the people of taqwa. Because taqwa is what? That you're so careful, so conscious, you're keeping away from this and you're keeping away from that. You're careful about what you say, about what you think, about what you feel, about what you do, about what you look at. This is taqwa. It's like you have chained yourself. You've restricted yourself. But those who live carefully now, in Jannah, they will be free. They will be free. Because the description of Jannah that is given over here, لَهُمْ فِيهَا مَا يَشَاءُونَ What does that mean? They're free. Enjoy yourself. There is no maximum. Just enjoy. الَّذِينَ تَتَوَفَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Who are the people of taqwa? The people who are humble. In what state do they die? When the angels come to take their souls, what is their state? Tayyibin. Ones that are tayyib. Tayyibin plural? Tayyib. They live a clean life. They live a good life. Tayyib, that which is clean. So how are they clean? Meaning in their physical body only they're very clean? Physically clean. Spiritually clean. Tayyibin. Their heart, their thinking, their words. Clean. Even Taymiyyah. Like I mentioned to you, he had many enemies. And many times later on, they would go and apologize to him. So when he was imprisoned in the last two years of his life, he was asked by one of his opponents, basically the one who had imprisoned him, that Ibn Taymiyyah should forgive them. And he said, I have forgiven everybody. I have forgiven everybody. Imagine if someone does something, complains about you so that you end up in jail. Your heart would be full of what? Extreme anger and rage. But that anger is going to destroy who? You. But look at that man, so peaceful he was, that he said, I have already forgiven all my opponents. This is a clean heart. طيبين يقولون سلام عليكم The angels will say, peace be on you. أُدُخُلُوا الْجَنَّةِ Enter Jannah. بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Because of what you used to do. Because of what you used to do. You did something. You didn't just say and think and wish and feel. No, you also did something. So now, entry into Jannah. Why? Because good life, clean life, clean heart, clean words, clean actions, clean body, clean ruh. هَلْ يَنْظُرُونَ now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, after showing us both of these categories of people, arrogant and humble, there's a difference, right? So those who are just standing by watching, Allah asks, هَلْ يَنظُرُونَ What are they waiting for? Are they waiting? إِلَّا except أَن تَأْتِيَهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ That the angels should come to them. أَوْ يَأْتِيَ أَمْرُ رَبِّكَ Or the command of your Lord should come. Which command? Of punishment, of death. But why the delay? What is holding us back from running to Allah? What is holding us back from obeying Allah's words, from accepting them, from reading them, from reciting them, from following them, implementing them? What is holding us back? Are they waiting for the angels of death? Are they waiting for some punishment? 
كَذَلِكَ فَعْلَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ Thus did the people before them do. They also delayed. They said, yeah, we'll see tomorrow. Maybe after a few years. وَمَا ظَلَمَهُمُ اللَّهُ But when their time ended, and they were punished, Allah did not wrong them. وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ But they were wronging themselves. فَأَصَابَهُمْ So it reached them. سَيِّئَاتُ The evils of مَا عَمِلُوا That which they did. Meaning the evil consequences that they received were what? A result of مَا عَمِلُوا What they had done. وَحَاقَ بِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ وَحَاقَ بِهِمْ And it surrounded them. حَيَاقَ To surround. What surrounded them? مَا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ That which they used to mock at. Which they used to make fun of. What did they mock at? Angels of death. What did they make fun of? Afterlife. What did they make fun of? The threat of Allah's punishment. What is it that a person makes fun of? Have you ever made fun of something? So why is it that certain people or certain things we pick on and we mock at them and certain others we don't? Like for example, a particular friend of yours. Sometimes even on their face. You know, like some good friends, they're such that you can make fun of them on their face and they won't mind. And you'll make fun of them. But there are some others who, even though you're very close to them, but they're just not the type that you would make fun of them. You don't take it seriously. Meaning, one friend, you know what they're like. Non-serious attitude, happy, funny. And others, they're very dignified and very proper and very um, sensitive. So, what is not that serious, when something is not a big deal, then you make fun of it. So likewise, when people make fun of Allah's promises, Angels, Day of Judgment, Hellfire, Paradise, when they make fun of this, what does it mean? They don't take these matters seriously. Because if they did, they would never dare to make fun of them. وَحَاقَ بِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ 